The Mirror of the Sea by Joseph Conrad The Fine Art The other year, looking through a newspaper of sound principles, but whose staff will persist in casting anchors and going to sea on a ship, uff, I came across an article upon the season's yachting, and behold, it was a good article, to a man who had but little to do with pleasure sailing, though all sailing is a pleasure, and certainly nothing whatever with racing in open waters, the writer's strictures upon the handicapping of yachts were just intelligible and no more, and I do not pretend to any interest in the enumeration of the great races of that year. As to the fifty-two-foot linear raiders praised so much by the writer, I am warmed up by his approval of their performances. But as far as any clear conception goes, the descriptive phrase, so precise to the comprehension of a yachtsman, evokes no definite image in my mind. The writer praises that class of pleasure vessels, and I am willing to endorse his words, as any man who loves every craft afloat would be ready to do. I am disposed to admire and respect the 52-foot linear raiders on the word of a man who regrets in such a sympathetic and understanding spirit the threatened decay of yachting seamanship. Of course, yacht racing is an organized pastime, a function of social idleness ministering to the vanity of certain wealthy inhabitants of these isles nearly as much as to their inborn love of the sea. But the writer of the article in question goes on to point out, with insight and justice, that for a great number of people, 20,000 I think he says, it is a means of livelihood, that it is, in his own words, an industry. Now the moral side of an industry, productive or unproductive, the redeeming and idle aspect of this breadwinning, is the attachment and preservation of the highest possible skill on the part of the craftsman. Such skill, the skill of technique, is more than honesty. It is something wider, embracing honesty and grace and rule and an elevated and clear sentiment, not altogether utilitarian, which may be called the honor of labor. It is made up of accumulated tradition, kept alive by individual pride, rendered exact by professional opinion, and, like the higher arts, it spurred on and sustained by discriminating praise. This is why the attainment of proficiency, the pushing of your skill with attention to the most delicate shades of excellence, is a matter of vital concern. Efficiency of a practically flawless kind may be reached naturally in the struggle for bread, but there is something beyond, a higher point, a subtle and unmistakable touch of love and pride beyond mere skill, almost an inspiration which gives to all work that finish which is almost art, which is art. As men of scrupulous honor set up a high standard of public conscience about the dead level of an honest community, so men of that skill, which passes into art by ceaseless striving, raise the dead level of correct practice in the crafts of land and sea. The conditions fostering the growth of that supreme, alive excellence, as well in work as in play, ought to be preserved with a most careful regard lest the industry or the game should perish of an insidious and inward decay. Therefore, I have read with profound regret in that article upon the yachting season of a certain year that the seamanship on board racing yachts is not now what it used to be only a few, very few years ago. For that was the gist of that article, written evidently by a man who not only knows but understands a thing, let me remark in passing, much rarer than one would expect, because the sort of understanding I mean is inspired by love, and love, though in a sense it may be admitted to be stronger than death, 
is by no means so universal and so sure. In fact, love is rare. The love of men, of things, of ideas, the love of perspected skill. For love is the enemy of haste. It takes count of passing days, of men who pass away, of a fine art matured slowly in the course of years, and doomed in a short time to pass away too, and be no more. Love and regret go hand in hand in this world of changes swifter than the shifting of the clouds reflected in the mirror of the sea. To penalize a yacht in proportion to the fineness of her performance is unfair to the craft and to her men. It is unfair to the perfection of her form and to the skill of her servants, for we men are, in fact, the servants of our creations. We remain in everlasting bondage to the productions of our brain and to the work of our hands. A man is born to serve his time on this earth, and there is something fine in the service being given on other grounds than that of utility. The bondage of art is very exacting, and as the writer of the article which started this train of thought says with lovable warmth, the sailing of yachts is a fine art. His contention is that racing, without time allowances for anything else but tonnage, that is, for size, has fostered the fine art of sailing to the pitch of perfection. Every sort of demand is made upon the master of a sailing yacht, and to be penalized in proportion to your success may be of advantage to the sport itself, but it has an obviously deteriorating effect upon the seamanship. The fine art is being lost. The sailing and racing of yachts has developed a class of fore and aft sailors, men born and bred to the sea, fishing in water and yachting in summer, men to whom the handling of that particular rig presents no mystery. It is their striving for victory that has elevated the sailing of pleasure craft to the dignity of a fine art in that special sense. As I have said, I know nothing of racing and but a little of fore and aft rig, but the advantages of such a rig are obvious, especially for purposes of pleasure, whether in cruising or racing. It requires less effort in handling. The trimming of the sailplanes to the wind can be done with speed and accuracy. The unbroken spread of the sea area is of infinite advantage, and the greatest possible amount of canvas can be displayed upon the least possible quantity of spars. Lightness and concentrated power are the great qualities of fore and aft rig. A fleet of fore and afters at anchor has its own slender graciousness. The setting of their sails resembles more than anything else the unfolding of a bird's wings. The facility of their evolutions is a pleasure to the eye. They are birds of the sea, whose swimming is like flying, and resembles more a natural function than the handling of a man-made, invented appliance. The fore and aft rig, in its simplicity and the beauty of its aspect under every angle of vision, is, I believe, unapproachable. A schooner, yawl, or cutter, in charge of a capable man, seems to handle herself as if endowed with the power of reasoning and the gift of swift execution. One laughs with sheer pleasure at a smart piece of maneuvering or at a manifestation of living creatures quick wit and graceful precision. Of those three varieties of fore and aft rig, the cutter, the racing rig, par excellence, is of an appearance the most imposing from the fact that practically all her canvas is in one piece. The enormous mainsail of a cutter, as she draws slowly past a point of land or the end of a jetty, under your admiring gaze, invests her with an air of lofty and silent majesty. 
At anchor, a schooner looks better. She has an aspect of greater efficiency and a better balance to the eye with her two masts distributed over the hull with a swaggering rake aft. The yawl rig one comes in time to love. It is, I should think, the easiest of all to manage. For racing, a cutter for a long pleasure voyage, a schooner for cruising in home waters, the yawl and the handling of them all is indeed a fine art. It requires not only the knowledge of the general principles of sailing, but of a particular acquaintance with the character of the craft. All vessels are handled in the same way, as far as theory goes, just as you may deal with all men on board and rigid principles. But if you want that success in life which comes from the affection and confidence of your fellows, then with no two men, however similar they may appear in their nature, will you deal in the same way. There may be a rule of conduct. There is no rule of human fellowship. To deal with men is as fine an art as is to deal with ships. Both men and ships live in an unstable element, are subject to subtle and powerful influences, and want to have their merits understood rather than their faults found out. It is not what your ship will not do that you would want to know to get on terms of successful partnership with her. It is, rather, that you ought to have a precise knowledge of what she will do for you when called upon to put forth what is in her by a sympathetic touch. At first sight, the difference does not seem great in either line of dealing with the difficult problem of limitations. But the difference is great. The difference lies in the spirit in which the problem is approached. After all, the art of handling ships is finer, perhaps, than the art of handling men. And like all fine arts, it must be based upon a broad, solid sincerity, which, like a law of nature, rules an infinity of different phenomena. Your endeavor must be single-minded. You would talk differently to a coal heaver and to a professor. But is this duplicity? I deny it. The truth consists in the genuineness of the feeling, in the genuine recognition of the two men, so similar and so different, as your two partners in the hazard of life. Obviously, a humbug, thinking only of winning his little race, would stand a chance of profiting by his artifices. Men, professors, or coal heavers, are easily deceived. They even have an extraordinary knack of lending themselves to deception, a sort of curious and inexplicable propensity to allow themselves to be led by the nose with their eyes open. But a ship is a creature which we have brought into the world, as it were, on purpose to keep us up to the mark. In her handling, a ship will not put up with a mere pretender as, for instance, the public will do with Mr. X, the popular statesman, Mr. Y, the popular scientist, or Mr. Z, the popular, what shall we say, anything from a teacher of high morality to a bagman, who have won their little race. But I would like, though not accustomed to betting, to wager a large sum that not one of the few first-rate skippers of racing yachts has ever been a humbug. It would have been too difficult. The difficulty arises from the fact that one does not deal with ships in a mob, but with a ship as an individual. So we may have to do with men, but in each of us there lurks some particle of the mob spirit of the mob temperament. No matter how earnestly we strive against each other, we remain brothers on the lowest side of our intellect and in the instability of our feelings. With ships it is not so. Much as they are to us, 
they are nothing to each other. Those sensitive creatures have no ears for our blandishments. It takes something more than words to cajole them to do our will, to cover us with glory. Luckily, too, or else there would have been more shoddy reputations for first-rate seamanship. Ships have no ears, I repeat, though, indeed, I think I have known ships who really seem to have had eyes, or else I cannot understand on what ground a certain 1,000-ton bark of my acquaintance, on one particular occasion, refused to answer her helm, thereby saving a frightful smash to two ships and to a very good man's reputation. I knew her intimately for two years, and in no other instance, either before or since, have I known her to do that thing. The man she had served so well, guessing perhaps at the depths of his affection for her, I have known much longer, and in bare justice to him, I must say that this confidence-shattering experience, though so fortunate, only augmented his trust in her. Yes, our ships have no ears, and thus they cannot be deceived. I would illustrate my idea of fidelity as between man and ship, between the master and his art, by a statement which, though it might appear shockingly sophisticated, is really very simple. I would say that a racing yacht skipper, who thought of nothing else but the glory of winning the race, would never attain to any eminence of reputation. The genuine masters of their craft, I say this confidently from my experience of ships, have thought of nothing but of doing their very best by the vessel under their charge. To forget oneself, to surrender all personal feeling in the service of that fine art, is the only way for a seaman to the faithful discharge of his trust. Such is the service of a fine art and of ships that sail the sea, and therein I think I can lay my finger upon the difference between the seamen of yesterday, who are still with us, and the seamen of tomorrow, who already entered upon the possession of their inheritance. History repeats itself. But the special call of an art which has passed away is never reproduced. It is as utterly gone out of the world as the song of a destroyed wild bird. Nothing will awaken the same response of pleasurable emotion or conscientious endeavor. And the sailing of any vessel afloat is an art whose fine form seems already receding from us on its way to the overshadowed valley of oblivion. The taking of a modern steamship about the world, though one would not minimize its responsibilities, has not the same quality of intimacy with nature, which, after all, is an indispensable condition to the building up of an art. It is less personal and a more exact calling, less arduous, but also less gratifying, and the lack of close communion between the artist and the medium of his art. It is, in short, less a matter of love. Its effects are measured exactly in time and space as no effect of art can be. It is less personal and a more exact calling, less arduous, but also less gratifying, and the lack of close communion between the artist and the medium of his art. It is, in short, less a matter of love. Its effects are measured exactly in time and space, as no effect of an art can be. It is an occupation which a man not desperately subject to seasickness can be imagined to follow with content, without enthusiasm, without industry, without affection. Punctuality is its watchword. The incertitude which attends closely every artistic endeavor is absent from its regulated enterprise. It has no great moments of self-confidence or moments no less great of doubt and heart-searching. It is an industry which, like other industries, has its romance, its honor, 
and its rewards, its bitter anxieties, and its hours of ease. But such seagoing has not the artistic quality of a single-handed struggle with something much greater than itself. It is not the laborious, absorbing practice of an art whose ultimate result remains on the knees of the gods. It is not an individual, temperamental achievement, but simply the skilled use of a captured force, merely another step forward upon the way of universal conquest. Every passage of a ship of yesterday, whose yards were braced round eagerly the very moment the pilot, with his pockets full of letters, had got over the side, was like a race, a race against time, against an ideal standard of achievement, outstripping the expectations of common men. Like all true art, the general conduct of a ship and her handling, in particular cases, had a technique which could be discussed with delight and pleasure by men who found in their work not bread alone, but an outlet for the peculiarities of their temperament to get the best and truest effect from the infinitely varying moods of sky and sea, not pictorially, but in the spirit of their calling, was their vocation, one and all, and they recognized this with as much sincerity and drew as much inspiration from this reality as any man who ever put brush to canvas. The diversity of temperaments was immense amongst those masters of the fine art. Some of them were like royal academicians of a certain kind. They never startled you by a touch of originality, but by a fresh audacity of inspiration. They were safe, very safe. They went about solemnly in the assurance of their consecrated and empty reputation. Names are odious, but I remember one of them who might have been their very president, the P.R.A. of the Seacraft. His weather-beaten and handsome face, his portly presence, his shirt fronts and broad cuffs and gold links, his air of bluff distinction, impressed the humble beholders, Steve Doors, tally clerks, tide waiters, as he walked ashore over the gangway of his ship lying at the circular quay in Sydney. His voice was deep, hearty, and authoritative, the voice of a very prince amongst sailors. He did everything with an air which put your attention on the alert and raised your expectations. But the result, somehow, was always on stereotyped lines, unsuggestive, empty of any lesson that one could lay to heart. He kept his ship in apple pie order, which would have been seamanlike enough, but for a finicking touch in its details. His officers affected a superiority over the rest of us, but the boredom of their souls appeared in their manner of dreary submission to the fads of their commander. It was only his apprenticed boys whose irrepressible spirits were not affected by the solemn and respectable mediocrity of that artist. There were four of these youngsters, one the son of a doctor, another of a colonel, the third of a jeweler. The name of the fourth was Twenty Man, and this is all I remember of his parentage. But not one of them seemed to possess the smallest spark of gratitude in composition, though their commander was a kind of man in his way, and had made a point of introducing them to the best people in the town in order that they should not fall into the bad company of boys belonging to other ships. I regret to say that they made faces at him behind his back, and imitated the dignified carriage of his head without any concealment whatever. This master of the fine art was a personage and nothing more, but as I have said, there was an infinite diversity of temperament amongst the masters of the fine art I have known. Some were great impressionists. 
they impressed upon you the fear of God and immensity, or, in other words, the fear of being drowned with every circumstance of terrific grandeur. One may think that the locality of your passing away by means of suffocation in water does not really matter very much. I am not so sure of that. I am perhaps unduly sensitive, but I confess that the idea of being suddenly spilt into an infuriated ocean in the midst of darkness and uproar affected me always with a sensation of shrinking distaste. To be drowned in a pond, though it might be called an ignominious fate by the ignorant, is yet a bright and peaceful ending in comparison with some other endings to one's earthly career, which I have mentally quaked at in the intervals or even in the midst of violent exertions. But let that pass. Some of the masters whose influence left a trace upon my character to this very day combined a fierceness of conception with a certitude of execution upon the basis of just appreciation of means and ends which is the highest quality of the man of action and an artist is a man of action whether he creates a personality invents an expedient or finds the issue of a complicated situation there were masters too i have known whose very art consisted in avoiding every conceivable situation it is needless to say that they never did great things in their craft but they were not to be despised for that. They were modest. They understood their limitations. Their own masters had not handed the sacred fire into the keeping of their cold and skillful hands. One of those last I remember especially, now gone to his rest from that sea which his temperament must have made a scene of little more than a peaceful pursuit, only once did he attempt a stroke of audacity. One early morning, with a steady breeze, entering a crowded roadstead. But he was not genuine in this display, which might have been art. He was thinking of his own self. He hankered after the meretriculous glory of a showy performance. As rounding a dark, wooded point, bathed in fresh air and sunshine, we opened to view a crowd of shipping at anchor lying half a mile ahead of us, perhaps, he called me aft from my station on the forecastle head and, turning over and over his binoculars in his brown hand, said, Do you see that big heavy ship with white lower masts? I am going to take up a berth between her and the shore. Now, do you see to it that the men jump smartly at the first order? I answered, A, A, sir, and verily believed that this would be a fine performance. We dashed on through the fleet in magnificent style. There must have been many open mouths and following eyes on board whose ships, Dutch, English, with a sprinkling of Americans and a German or two, who had all hoisted their flags at eight o'clock, as if in honor of our arrival. It would have been a fine performance if it had come off, but it did not. Through a touch of self-seeking, that modest artist of solid merit became untrue to his temperament. It was not with him art for art's sake. It was art for his own sake, and a dismal failure was the penalty he paid for that greatest of sins. It might have been even heavier, but as it happened, we did not run our ship ashore, nor did we knock a large hole in the big ship whose lower masts were painted white. But it is a wonder that we did not carry away the cables of both our anchors, for, as may be imagined, I did not stand upon the order to let go that came to me in a quavering, quite unknown voice from his trembling lips. I let them both go with a celerity which to this day astonishes my memory. No average merchantman's anchors have ever been let go with such miraculous smartness, and they both held. I could have kissed their rough, coal-iron palms in gratitude 
if they had not been buried in slimy mud under ten fathoms of water. Ultimately, they brought us up with the jib-boom of a Dutch brig poking through our spanker. Nothing worse, and a miss is as good as a mile. But not in art. Afterwards, the master said to me in a shy mumble, she wouldn't luff up in time somehow. What's the matter with her? And I made no answer. Yet the answer was clear. The ship had found out the momentary weakness of her man. Of all the living creatures upon land and sea, it is ships alone that cannot be taken in by barren pretenses that will not put up with bad art from their masters.